As much as we love watching giant rockets blast off into space with massive thundering displays of brute force combustion energy, we also appreciate that this is not an ideal way to be putting things into orbit. For one, we know that burning massive amounts of hydrocarbon fuel like kerosene or methane is only contributing to an already very serious problem we have with excess carbon in our environment. And secondly, the amount of time, resources, and capital that goes into constructing these monolithic booster cores, most of which remain single-use products, is just creating a bottleneck in our capacity to reach beyond our atmosphere. Spin Launch is a California tech startup who are taking an alternative approach on their quest to put objects into space. They are trading in the launch pad for a gigantic centrifuge machine that literally spins payloads into orbit. This idea may be unconventional, but it's not unfounded and already has received major support from NASA. In the most simple terms, this is a space catapult, or maybe a space slingshot. So let's talk about it. This is the space race. These newcomers to the aerospace industry are snubbing the tried and true method of putting a gigantic rocket booster under your payload and pushing off from the ground in a massive fiery plume. Instead, they're going back to the fundamentals. Kinetic energy equals mass times velocity squared. Disclaimer, not a physicist. And in this case, the mass is our payload to orbit. So, to transfer energy into that payload, we simply need to increase its velocity. And this is where the space slingshot comes into play. The centrifuge design is the most effective way to generate velocity, because velocity is simply the amount of distance that an object travels in a given amount of time. And by spinning around in a circle, the payload is able to travel a large amount of distance without actually going anywhere. The basic plan here is for the payload to be flung out from the catapult at a hypersonic speed of around Mach 6, which would be about equivalent to the top speed of the fastest jet aircraft in the world, the X-15. It's about 4 to 4,500 miles per hour, or roughly 2 kilometers per second. The projectile that carries the payload is going to be skinned with an ultra-sleek aeroshell, like a miniature dart-shaped rocket with a super low drag coefficient. Once yeeted from the space catapult, the mini rocket will gain 72 kilometers of altitude with nothing but kinetic energy, clearing the thickest parts of our atmosphere without burning a single drop of rocket fuel. And no, yeeted is not an official term, but it's just fun to say. Now, physics also tells us that what goes up must come down. So at the peak of its sling, the aero shell will break away, revealing the spacecraft within, which is actually a two-stage rocket. The first engine kicks on and accelerates the payload through the remainder of Earth's atmosphere before separating. And then, just like any other space vehicle, the second stage engine pushes the payload to orbital velocity and delivers the payload into the desired altitude. This is the same principle that Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit makes use of. Virgin launch their rocket from a jet aircraft at high altitude, and that allows them to reach orbit without using a giant booster stage on their vehicle. However, the 747 jet cannot reach anywhere near the speed of altitude that is imparted by the space catapult. And that jet itself burns a lot of fossil fuel and costs a lot of money to operate, which kind of negates a lot of the benefits. At the heart of spin launch is their space catapult, the centrifugal mass accelerator. This is a very simple concept that requires a very complex implementation. The challenge to overcome here is reaching the necessary velocity without the whole machine breaking apart. The full space catapult will measure 45 meters in radius. That's the distance between the center of the circle and the outside rim. And within that circle, the payload will have to spin at 450 rotations per minute or RPM. 450 RPM 
is not very much inside a small centrifuge, like the crankshaft inside of the engine in a passenger vehicle. But on a massive scale like the space catapult, the force experienced by the payload will be up to 10,000 Gs, or 10,000 times the force of gravity. So a couple of major engineering feats need to be accomplished to make that possible. The actual spinning action is the easy part. An industrial electric motor can easily generate the energy necessary to reach velocity. The spin launch engineers said that their motor outputs the equivalent energy of at least six or seven Tesla Model S Plaid vehicles. It's dealing with the consequences of that energy that gets tricky. So the arm or the tether that holds the payload as it spins is going to experience the same extreme gravity effect. The weight of the aeroshell vehicle at the end of that arm is going to be 10 metric tons. And at the force of 10,000 Gs, that will equal 100,000 metric tons of weight exerted on the tip of the arm. So the arm needs to be incredibly strong, but it also needs to be as light as possible because the energy required to move the arm is wasted. So Spin Launch are constructing their arm using a solid carbon fiber reinforced plastic material. Their engineers say that the strength to weight ratio of this material is unmatched by anything else on the market. At full scale, the arm inside the Sling Launch catapult will likely be the single strongest tensile structure on Earth. Another force that needs to be dealt with here is drag. At launch velocity, any air inside the centrifuge would create a massive amount of resistance on the payload and the arm. So the whole operation needs to occur in a vacuum. This is the same idea as a hyperloop transport system. In order to have ultra high speed transport that reaches near the speed of sound, we need to operate them in a vacuum tube or a near vacuum at least. Spin Launch says that they don't require a total vacuum like what exists in outer space, but they do need to get the majority of the air out of their launch machine and then keep it out. So creating a vacuum chamber is not super difficult, it just requires a large pump. The complication comes in when the vehicle has to inevitably depart the centrifuge. It needs an open door, but that would also allow air to rush back in and fill the void. And while the payload may already be on its way to space, the arm is still going to be spinning away inside the machine at incredible speeds. So if air flows in through the exit point and hits the arm, that's going to generate a massive amount of friction and heat and likely disaster. So the payload needs to leave through an airlock. Before the outer door opens, an inner door needs to close. And remember, that this payload is traveling at six times the speed of sound, two kilometers per second. So those doors need to move fast, like just so insanely fast, it's hard to even fathom. Spin Launch is actually talking about having a series of multiple redundant airlocks that the vehicle will pass through in its short trip through the exit tube of the machine. So there is a lot of complexity to overcome here. So you probably noticed that most of what we're saying here is hypothetical planning for when this machine reaches full scale. It's not there yet. At the moment, Spin Launch is operating with a one third scale version of their space slingshot. It's still generating enough kinetic energy to launch a payload tens of thousands of feet into the air, but nowhere near the capability to reach orbit. In September, Spin Launch completed their 10th successful test launch in less than one year, and this was a very special flight for the company. This was their first launch to carry third-party payloads on board. Experiments and measuring devices from NASA, Airbus, and Cornell University. These partner agencies were looking to gather critical data on the launch environment and payload integration process. Earlier this year, Spin Launch signed a Space Act agreement with NASA to develop, integrate, and fly a NASA payload, providing the agency with the information necessary to determine the future potential of commercial launch opportunities with Spin Launch. Basically, NASA likes the idea and they want to support the company, but they need to make sure that their payloads can be integrated into the launch vehicle, and then most importantly, 
whether their payload can withstand the force of the kinetic launch. To figure this out, NASA sent a data acquisition unit up with the spin launch vehicle. The sensor suite was equipped with two accelerometers in addition to a gyroscope, magnometer, and sensors for pressure, temperature, and humidity. We know that following the test launch, the vehicle was successfully retrieved with the payloads intact. Of course, this giant bullet comes back down with a lot of force, so it buries itself in the ground and has to be dug up with an excavator. We know that NASA and Spin Launch have reviewed the flight data, but we haven't heard anything about what they've determined from that test flight yet. So what can we expect to see moving forward is a slow and steady ramp up in Spin Launch capabilities. They're just going to keep building bigger and bigger slingshots until they reach a machine that can throw a vehicle high enough for it to get into space using only the power from those two tiny rocket engines. Spin Launch is anticipating that they reach orbit with this technology by 2026. Now, this is obviously no replacement for a rocket like the Falcon 9, and it never will be. The payload capacity for a space catapult will always be very low, but as we advance our satellite technology, there is a growing market for small sat and micro sat launches. There are plenty of companies out there who would love to get a device the size of a shoebox into space, but have very limited options for hitching a ride on a full sized rocket. This is the market that small launch startup companies like Firefly, Astra, and Rocket Lab are currently looking to serve with their vehicles. Spin Launch has a lot of advantages with their method that a rocket-based launcher won't be able to match. For example, the reliability of a machine driven by an electric motor. We've all seen with the Artemis 1 debacle the issues that can come up with just trying to load propellant into a rocket, not to mention the infrastructure needed to support the transit and storage of rocket fuel and cryogenic liquid oxygen. Then there is launch cadence. Until the SpaceX Super Heavy proves itself, there is no rocket booster in the world that can be used more than once in a day. Spin Launch is proposing that they can launch five payloads per day from a single catapult machine. And we know that higher volume equals lower cost. So this can very quickly become an affordable method to get a very small amount of mass into orbit. And that would again, be pretty revolutionary for outer space research. Think about what we could accomplish if we were able to put so many more small scale research projects and measuring devices into orbit than what is possible with only a rocket fleet alone. So that's pretty cool to think about. But like I said, no one over here is a physicist. So we're not exactly sure just how possible any of this really is. So let us know below what you think is going to happen with spin launch and are space catapults the future of small orbital launchers. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.